Dr. Thatcher, how are you today? I'm doing great, Javier. I appreciate the time you're, you're spending on this, and I, and I look forward to it. Thank you very much. And it's an honor to have you here with us uh, to share uh, this important information with the Spanish-speaking scientific community with those uh, clinicians and researchers that are uh, interested in uh, QEEG and uh, uh, feedback. Okay, we will start uh, this interview with the following uh, question. Well, everyone knows about your professional background in the applied neuroscience. And my first question is, uh, why focusing in the EEG and neurofeedback instead of other branches of neuroscience, such as the pharmaceutical industry? Uh, well, firstly, um, I worked at the National Institutes of Health as a project manager to integrate imaging of the brain, which was missing. Pharmaceuticals have been around for hundreds of years. And they're delivered through the bloodstream, the anterior, middle, and posterior cerebral arteries, and they bathe the entire brain. They're not specific. And in the 1990s, about $2 billion was put into the Human Brain Project. I was the project manager for the first 128 channel EEG, and I was part of the team that would integrate EEG with PET scans, spec scans, functional MRI. Diffusion tensor imaging, MEG, et cetera. So we put that all together into a common coordinate system. And uh, and we discovered that the brain is actually organized in networks. It's quite specific. The, there's a small subset of networks. If you do diffusion tensor imaging on the entire brain, or at least the cortex and all its connections, you can see the 100 billion neurons are really organized in six clusters. So 100 billion is actually six clusters. We did not know that. And each of those six clusters is then subdivided into a smaller subset that's less than 100. It could be maybe 120, 150, but you take 100 billion and you've now got a network with hubs. Those are nodes, okay, and then connections between the hubs. You can imagine that in a city where there's different parts of the city have roads connected to uh, uh, hubs. These are centers in the city where communication and commerce happens. The same thing is going on in the brain. And so we didn't know that until then, as I mentioned, but what drugs do and pharmaceuticals, they bathe the entire city. They don't, let's say there's just a problem with one of the hubs that deals with uh, memory or another hub is dealing with anxiety. Uh, uh, well, the drugs are just gonna affect everything. And so we discovered that it's really these hubs, there are weak hubs and then there are compensatory hubs. And so the, and the pharmaceuticals are incapable of just targeting one hub or two hubs or five hubs, et cetera. These hubs really are comprised of a lot of different kinds of neurons and they're anatomically, structurally unique. And in 1909, uh, Kobe and Brodman took, he did uh, slices of the human brain and also primate brain and other types of brains. And he discovered that the neurons are not all the same in the brain. They actually are physically different. So you have the first one he saw was in motor cortex. He called that Robin area one. And then he saw the neurons next to that area were different than the, the Robin area one. So he called it Robin area two and then three, et cetera. And he documented that in great detail and actually you can download his original work from our website. I'll be happy to show that to you. Uh, in which he then found 44 hubs in the left hemisphere and 44 hubs in the right hemisphere. Uh, and that's based purely on anatomy, the cytoarchitectural structure. Uh, in those days, uh, they argued, and this is after the late 1800s with Darwin, that structure and function are related. And so therefore he uh, concluded that if the hubs are or the groups of neurons are anatomically different, they must have different structure, of different functions on I me. Mean. So sure enough, the motor cortex has a different function than the visual cortex. Uh, the somatosensory cortex has a different function than the frontal lobes, or the somatosensory cortex is different than the auditory cortex. So structure and function was established actually at the turn of the century. Now in the 1990s with the Human Brain Project, uh, Brodman was resurrected from the dead, essentially, 
because we could see PET scans and functional MRI, MRI came out with 44 hubs on the left and 44 on the right. They corresponded largely to the Broadman uh, anatomical hubs. And so uh, that's why uh, today, if you are specific and you link symptoms to dysregulation in brain networks, then uh, that also turned out to be a boom for the National Institutes of Health. That was done in the 1990s. So another $2 billion went into the, the second decade. And uh, in the year 2020, another billion or $2 billion is going into the Human Brain Project. So it's continuing. But the pharmaceutical industry just doesn't, uh, it's not able to link uh, specific medications to specific hubs. It uh, just kind of dampens everything down. So now we, now once we discover where, how much more about how the brain works, then you can devise neurofeedback specifically to reinforce a larger number of synapses, so increase the size or number of synapses um, by uh, reinforcement through operant conditioning. Uh, that was uh, essentially, a, it, it causes the dopamine to uh, be uh, extruded, which then increases the size and number of synapses or other neuromodulators like serotonin uh, that change synapses. That's their job. So you can modify the brain, but you got to be specific. You can't just put an electrode at, at the top of your head here and expect to affect the, the correct weak hub. So we want to reinforce the hubs that are not doing their job so they do the job better a uh, baseball analogy would be like if the second baseman is has a weak arm uh, one, one you can train because he's got to throw the ball to home plate uh, so the second baseman has got to be able to train to throw his arm better and have a better throw or the first baseman will compensate uh, depending on where uh, you know the batter is that is done all the time for uh, team um, activities or if the right fielder has a weak arm, the, the second baseman has got to get deeper into a right field to relay the ball uh, to third base or to home. So you got weak hubs and you got compensatory hubs. You identify the weak hubs, reinforce the number of synapses and the size of synapses by operant conditioning. Now that method of operant conditioning gave rise to, it was discovered really by Thorndike in the 1900s, but eventually Eric Kandel got a Nobel Prize in the year 2000 for uh, showing exactly how uh, operant conditioning, how dopamine will engage the postsynaptic membrane, which creates cytokines that go up through microtubules to the RNA. Uh, the RNA then sends out signals to change the size and number of synapses. So operant conditioning and biofeedback, those are real things. Uh, they, 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 it operates every day in our lives when we have an intent to move or we make errors or with curiosity, we explore the world, we discover things. Uh, and then when we do discover things, that actually changes the size and number of our synapses. So uh, that's essentially what it is. It's using the operating conditioning as well-established at a physiological or molecular level uh, to identify the weak hubs that are linked to symptoms and then reinforce the number and size of synapses so that you reduce the severity of the symptoms. Great. Uh, Dr. Thatcher, the next question is about brain mapping. Everybody is uh, talking about brain mapping, but it seems they don't really know uh, what are they talking about when they mention uh, brain mapping. So could you explain us what really brain mapping is? Yeah, can you see, if you can see my screen, can you see my screen up there? Right. Okay, this is this is raw EEG. Okay, it, I happen to edit it. I'll I'll just get rid of those lines so you can just see what people had to deal with. Uh, Nineteen twenty nine, right around there, um, Hans Berger discovered that you can measure electrical uh, activity from the scalp, and the brain weighs, uh, you know in pounds, I mean, you know, let's say a, a kilogram and a half or two kilograms for kilograms or two and a half, three pounds. Uh, and it consumes 20 to 40% of our blood glucose. That small little uh, mass floating inside our skull consumes 20 to 40% of our blood glucose, just to emphasize that. Where does that glucose go, all that energy? It goes into creating electricity. 
It's called the EEG. Now, the problem is the skull is thick, and so it's an insulator. And when you put electrodes on the scalp, it's only in microvolts. But if you remove the skull, your, your brain neck, the EEG is in millivolts, okay? And the skull it makes it real small. And uh, so the amplifiers in 1929, 1930 weren't the best, but they nonetheless could see the electrical energies. In the late 1930s, early 1940s, amplifiers were improved so they could get the squiggles you see right there in front of you. But who can interpret all these skipped squiggles? Okay? If you look at these waves, they're really great. Everybody's somewhat unique, and you see all these waves. It's very difficult to interpret just visually the waves. Now, people tried to do this for several decades until uh, digital computers were discovered. So that's called um, uh, non-QEG, it's, it's, which is eyeball EEG. You don't quantify. The Q in quantitative EEG stands for quantification. But it's very difficult to quantify with your eyeballs. Okay, so that, that created the field of neurology, actually, in the 1940s. Uh, there were no neurologists or psychiatrists. They broke away. The neurology, the psychiatrists were influenced by Freud in behavioral cognitive therapy, helping people, talking therapy, all that stuff. The uh, other medical, young medical students who were more uh, analytical and scientific, they liked the EEG. So they slowly created uh, neurology. Uh, they also were astute politically. They were able to get uh, lobbyists in Europe and the U.S., uh, to demand that uh, neurologists be hired for every hospital so they can visually examine these squiggles. And the psychiatrists are off dealing with Freud, you know, so the, the neurology grew based upon non-QEG. It's eyeball EEG, visual examination. Now, today, it's the same thing. The American Academy of Neurology largely condemns the use of a computer, okay? They, they say QEG is a bunch of hoax. It's a, you know, they don't like using computers. They don't like to learn how to use a computer and analyze the EEG. So that's the difference. It's just one is quantitative. It uses Fourier transforms. It uses uh, joint time frequency analyses. It uses the same mathematics that NASA uses. It uses the same mathematics that geologists use to uh, understand earthquakes. And so it's fundamental science. But the neurologists like to just use their eyeballs to examine these squiggles. Now, you, you really don't, uh, the, the, what's going on up there, you have a bunch of hubs inside the brain, right? So each hub is actually is creating a bit, they're all mixed together at the surface. So by using um, quantitative methods, you can uh, unscramble all those mixtures there and see where they come from from the hubs. You can see the hippocampus, you can see the frontal lobes, you can see the occipital lobes, the visual cortex, the parietal lobes. Each of these parts of the brain have somewhat different functions. Now we can actually link the hubs uh, to symptoms and to cognitive functions, vision, you know, movement, et cetera. You cannot do that just visually examining the squiggles. So that, that's, and, and one way to help in that is to create a map. For example, here, I'm going to just edit some EEG very quickly. It's, one, uh, it's a whole topic there, but you don't need um, ICA or anything to edit EEG. I'm just going to get two minutes of EEG. I'm going to remove drowsiness, eye movement, and muscle. And you'll see how fast this is. Okay, I just selected one minute, 59 seconds, artifact-free EEG. Uh, I'm going to now um, create some maps. I'm going to look at raw scores, okay? No, no norms, just raw. Raw digital data. I'm going to look at the theta band for now because that's where his pathology is. Oh, I have to look at the color map. <laughs> You're basically talking about the difference between the classic EEG and the quantitative EEG, right? Right. Brain maps are quantitative EEG. These are brain maps. It just makes it easier to see what's going on, you see. These are raw scores. It's, it's like, this shows there's a lot of energy in Delta in this part of the brain. Now, this person, this is a, a veteran who was assaulted and uh, with a bat, hit in the right parietal lobe. He has paralysis in the left side. Uh, he's um, 
uh, he has what's called spatial neglect. Uh, you know, like I was at the, the Veterans Administration Hospital here in Florida, where I saw him as a patient, and he would, um, he was a very nice person, but he doesn't see me on the left side. I had a white, uh, you know, the doctor's coat on, and I would walk in, and to the left, he wouldn't see me, until I went to his right side, and he said, oh, hi, doc, how you doing? You know, that's called spatial neglect. That's your right parietal lobe is important for that. So you can see his right parietal lobe is not doing very well. Let's see that a bit. I can go through one of these rhythms over right here. I can slow it down a bit for four seconds. You can see this. You see his right parietal lobe. It's got a lot of advantage. But now we don't know if that's normal or not. We, 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 it's just like a blood test. Even though you see... This and, you, and, and now quantitatively, it's a lot better than visual because you can't even see this. If you, I mean, if you examine the squiggles, so you want to know well, how severely deviant from normal is that, and which frequency is deviant from normal? So, a blood test this is, is the analogy. Uh, is your, uh, you know, cholesterol too high or too low? Well, how do you know if it is? Well, it's compared to a group of healthy people that don't have high cholesterol, but they have a range of cholesterol. Or it's compared to, um, what about red blood cell count? How do you know if you have too many red blood cells or too few blood cells? Well, you compare it to a group of healthy people that don't have too many and too few. That's what normative databases are about in medicine. Just a reference. Because if you just guessed, well, I think your red blood cell count is too high, you may be wrong. It could be that it's too low, because you just guessed. Or your liver enzymes are too low. You know, You never know, they may be too high. You need a reference to healthy people to, do, to get some idea of uh, how deviant from normal. And so it helps refine the clinical linkage between the patient's symptoms and dysregulation in the brain. So there's where the normative data comes. You can use the raw data. Here, I'll just show you the difference with, norm, with compared to disease scores. Now we're going to compare the liver enzymes or the cholesterol uh, or the hematocrits to disease scores. Normative data. Okay, so it's more objective. Well, it helps you see where the problem is. Just, you see it coming and going. So, for example, I'll go to the beginning of the record. Here you can see the pathology right here. Here's right parietal is many times larger than the left parietal. Right central is many times larger than the left. His left hemisphere is completely normal, but you can see where his problem is at the surface. And so the comparing it to a reference database is just like a blood test. You can guess, like I said, that whether your constituents of your blood are, are not normal or not, but compare it. That's quantitative. That's done throughout medicine. And there's many, many examples of normative databases in medicine, not just EEG. Now, this is an FDA-registered normative database. So it has some government oversight on it to make sure that the uh, selection criteria were correct, that the statistics are correct, that it's published in the peer-reviewed literature, that people can see the science. Uh, there are people that just go down the street and measure EEG from their neighbors, and they say, okay, I got a normative database but you don't know anything about those neighbors and you don't know about their methods. And so they can't get their database registered by the FDA. Yeah, for, for many professionals, it, it makes sense. And we could conclude the normative QEG is more objective than traditional EEG because EEG depends on the experience and knowledge of, of the professional you know, to uh, for diagnosis. On the other hand, the normative EEG is comparing with a, a normal database. My next question uh, regarding with that is, why do you think a lot of neurologists and psychiatrists, not only in the Spanish-speaking world, but in, in, in the whole world, nowadays keep saying QEG lacks of clinical uh, or diagnosis validity? Uh, well, it, it's probably because of uh, ignorance, basically. Uh, the fact is, if you go to the National Library of Medicine uh, and um, type in EEG, 
in, in at least in the United States, it's called PubMed. There's over 170,000 peer-reviewed journal articles. Okay? Almost all of them are clinical. I say 90%, and 95% are quantitative EEG. So, but the psychiatrist doesn't know about the National Library of Medicine. Doesn't know that there's science that there's 150,000, 170,000 publications. Just doesn't know it. Uh, it nor many neurologists. Uh, I often testify. Or I used to. I don't like to do that anymore. But I was in one time in a court case where the neurologist said that uh, QEG is completely unreliable. Nobody uses it. The American Academy of Neurology condemns the use of computers. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's just bad, you should not use it, it should never be used in the court of law. He went on and on like this. And so I said to the, uh, the plaintiff's attorney, I said, ask him the following questions. He said, so he goes, he says, doctor, have you ever yourself recorded the EEG? He says, uh, you know, he says, did you ever put electrodes on a patient yourself and actually record it? And he says, no, I didn't do that. Technicians do that. So you, you're telling this court, you've never yourself personally recorded an EEG. So he says, of course not. So he's kind of insulted. Then he says, doctor, have you ever read uh, any uh, quantitative EEG books? And he says, no, I've never read any books on quantitative EEG. He says, doctor, have you ever uh, read any journal articles on quantitative EEG? He says, no, I've never read any journal articles. He says, Do you, doctor, are you aware there's over 150,000 peer-reviewed journal articles Clinical article from QEG in the NAS cited in the National Library of Medicine. And he says, No, I didn't know that. So then he turns to the judge and he says, Your Honor, this man is not qualified to be an expert in quantitative EEG. And he says, And I move that he be dismissed. And the judge says, Okay, granted, you're dismissed. <laughs> so you have to have facts. You can't just say that quantitative EEG is not real. Yeah, we have noticed here the automatic uh, answer, but when we question uh, their answer, we really can see they don't know what we are talking about when, when we are talking about a uh, normative uh, QEG. Well, if you go, it doesn't have to just be normative. If you do go to uh, the National Library of Medicine, uh, P-U-B-M-E-D, Google app, and then click on it, uh, it's all quantitative because, uh, in fact, since 1975, it's almost impossible uh, to uh, to publish a paper that's just like three neurologists looking at a bunch of squiggles and asking whether they agree with each other. Because actually, they only agree about 0 0.1, 0 0.2. There's very, very low uh, inter-rater reliability between non-QEG people looking at a, a bunch of squiggles. So you need a computer to do that. The, so the, that's the first step. The normative database is purely a reference to help refine that uh, quant quantification. You can do it with raw stores to some extent, but you get a better feeling of how deviant from normal. Uh, and uh, that's just part of it, because uh, you may have uh, deviant uh, liver enzymes, but that could be because your gallbladder or your spleen. It's not necessarily mean that your liver is bad. But you got to know whether your, your liver insides are elevated or too low, just to begin with. Right. Okay. Uh, the next question is about the true brain mapping or the true QEG. As you may know, a lot of literature is in English and uh, other language, but uh, Spanish. So. This is a kind of opportunity to in the scrupulous professionals and distributors of technology to sell something that is not really quantitative EG. Well, uh, they're not really compared to a, a database. And the, the reports are focusing on caloric pictures of the brain activity. So, have you heard about that technique that register four brain sites at a time for one hour? And, you know, they take about uh, one hour to, to complete the, the test, and, and later uh, they show reports only with the caloric maps. And what do you think about uh, that kind of techniques? Well, they're limited. 
uh, because the scalp surface um, is really any any point on the scalp is measuring practically the whole brain. Uh, it, it's certainly 90, roughly 95% of the energy in any electrode comes from six centimeters diameter away. Okay, so it's not precise. And as I mentioned, it, uh, there are specific hubs inside the brain uh, that are doing different jobs. The parietal lobe is different than the temporal lobes, which is different than the occipital lobes, which is different than the frontal lobes. The hippocampus is different than the amygdala. All these parts of the brain have different jobs to some extent. And you can't uh, really be specific. Now, the more specific you are about which parts are not working right, then the more likely you're going to you'll be able to help the patient. But if you're in the dark, you don't know that the hippocampus isn't working or the amygdala. And so it's like we have uh, eight systems in Fort Campbell, Kentucky, for soldiers from Afghanistan who have PTSD and traumatic brain injury. We have 22 systems in um, McDill Air Force Base for what's called the special ops. These are high IQ people in the, the Army, the Air Force, and the Navy for the United States. Uh, and these people, this is the military. They want to know if this soldier's amygdala is not working right. He comes back from Afghanistan and he can't sleep. He can't go to a store. He can't get along with his family. Uh, and you measure his amygdala. And his amygdala is five standard deviations outside of normal. Okay? So they start reinforcing the amygdala. Every time the amygdala starts behaving better, the, the DVD or the video or, or the colonel tells him to... to he says, soldier, make that green dot stay on. You know? uh, then the amygdala stop, the neurons stop shouting too much. And within a day or two, they are sleeping. That's the first thing. And then uh, they start to go to the store. They're not, they can get outside. They start getting along better with their family. And these are young kids. These are 18, 19, 20-year-old kids. Uh, they um, then they go back. They want to go back to Afghanistan. I know it's weird. I've been there to see this. And I... Uh, but they're really, you know, you know, you know how kid, how young men are. So. But they want to function better, and so if you train that amygdala uh, down and get the frontal lobes also to inhibit the amygdala, it's a number of different parts of the brain. The insula is also very important; that it gives rise to the autonomic nervous system reactions. Uh, so there's a number of hubs in the brain that they uh, focus on and reinforce towards greater stability. So the quantitative or the normative database helps them see that they're going in the right direction because sometimes you'll have too little or too much so you want to just move in the direction of the center of the healthy population but the same thing happens in blood tests you may have uh, hematocrits too low or too high well you want to go in the direction of the center of the healthy population okay so well, so four, you, four channels can't do it. You have to have 19 as a minimum. That is um, Maxwell's equations from the 1800s and uh, uh, Fourier, uh, Gauss, Laplace. The inverse solution was developed by uh, von Helmholtz in the 1800s. You have to look at the electrical field of the entire, uh, like a sphere. Imagine a balloon filled with saline and you got uh, sensors on the surface. Mathematically, you can figure out where the, and you have a battery inside the balloon that you can turn on and off. Mathematically, you can figure out exactly where that battery is. That's 1870 by Von, von Helmholtz. That's, that's what we use today. At NIH, it's big time now. That's what you use to get to see the amygdala. But you can't do that with four electrodes. You have to measure the entire electrical field. Now, here's an example. I'm going to, here, let's see if I can go to the, Laplacian. So right now, that's the electrical field. So I don't think I can do the Laplacian here. I'll try the, the, the first derivative is gets close to the Laplacian. Well, uh, I can, I'll show another example of essentially what you do is you take the electrical field, which is the elect electricity, and uh, Simone de Laplace in 1810 figured this out that you can determine the currents at right angles going through the skull. Okay. That's called the Laplacian transform. It's looking at the rate of change of the electrical field. So if it, well, when you put medications in, for example, it, the medications affect the, where you take the medication, it affects the entire brain. 
And so a Laplacian, anything that's the same everywhere in space is going to set, be set to zero. Okay? That's what the Laplacian does. And anything that's changing locally, let's say it's a right parietal lobe that's changing, or it's got to be as different than the surround, then that will be exaggerated. That's what the Laplacian does. NASA uses this when it uh, looks at different planet surfaces and uh, different uh, you know, uh, objects in space. They can see the valleys and the hills and the mountains by the contour enhancing of the Laplacian transform. Same with the, the brain. So that's what we do. That helps us get more focal. And now, you, again, you're linking the patient's symptoms to deviation from normal or of parts of the brain we know to be linked to symptoms. And then once you do that at the surface, and you just do it with one or two mouse clicks, it can be it happens very fast with neurogai. Then you go inside the brain, we'll show this in a minute, with the neuronavigator. And here, for example, let me, uh, your, your part is hiding it. So I'm going to go to five cycles per second. So here's his, here's his part of the brain I was showing you before that's deviant from normal. And that's the Laplacian at the surface. And now I'm going to remove the scalp. I'm, going to, I'm looking at all the networks. This guy has an attention problem, so I'm just looking at the attention network. I'm going to get rid of the uh, cortex. And there's the attention network. And uh, I'm going to, right now we're looking at 1.65 standard deviations. I'm just going to go down to zero, so it's, there are no norms. And that way you can see the, uh, the, you know, if I do this, you can see the network. And we can, um, let me see, I'm going to, an idea where that is. So you, you see what I mean? You, now we can go from the surface down into the brain. You can see where his pathology is or his problem, and you can see which hubs are deviant from normal. This gives you information as a clinician to move the patient towards greater stability so you don't have any colors there, you know, so that they're, they're functioning correctly. Okay. So you can't, do that. you can't do that what I just did with four electrodes. So I, I, I assume uh, devices like Primitive, Epoch, NeuroSky, and this kind of low-cost uh, EG systems are not compatible with NeuroGuide, for example, or with any normative database. And many of them not even with raw data because the amplifiers are defective and they're really just measuring noise. And they're very low quality. They're not FDA registered. And today, you can at least uh, in the in China selling a 19 channel EEG for one hundred dollars. So mm -hmm. the expense is not the factor. It's just education. Cognionics has a great one for uh, three thousand dollars. I know that's a lot of money, but if, if you have a patient, this you're getting a patient. You're, and you can see many patients a day. Each patient pays a little bit, and over a period of time, you can pay off that $3,000 or the $1,000 or whatever, but the amplifier, the 19-channel amplifiers are not that expensive. There are some experience with uh, psychology labs uh, which are using uh, that kind of low-cost EEG system. They are losing their investment and the projects? They may be. I, I really don't know. I, I know that they're very low quality. We've looked at several uh, there are some we could not get any uh, EEG out of. It was very difficult to get valid EEG. And then some had the band like on the forehead. You're not going to measure the electrical sources if you have a few electrodes on the forehead. I mean, it, it, it can be useful to, you know, I don't know. Uh, it's the Fort Campbell, for example, there's usually people get a change in one session, two sessions of biofeedback. Um, and then you usually go to 10 sessions. Like Fort Campbell, they only do 10 sessions for the soldiers. And they're happy with that. They've been doing that for you know, five or six years, so they get 90% uh, you know, improvement. Those that don't, uh, they, they, they do other kinds of uh, 
therapies with these young soldiers if they don't get better in uh, I think it's 90 days then they uh, they go to the, they kick them out of the army they, they're, they're just they're, they can't uh, go back to you know serving in the army but in any case uh, that's because it, it, you can get good effects and you can see the parts of the brain improving so and it's con totally consistent with the National Institutes of Health with thousands of papers published these uh, sky things or whatever it is you showed me there are very few very little publications no linkage it'd be very difficult to even get peer-reviewed approval because there are such low standards I mean, they don't meet the, the basic standards I, this is evidence-based uh, neurofeedback since we have evidence uh, several kind of uh, feedback approaches uh, based on the system of uh, a one two maybe four uh, eeg channels well even though we have heard about an approach a uh, focus on low neurofeedback what do you think about those approaches well um those are two those are somewhat different things. The history of neurofeedback started with, um, well, first of all, there's good science in animals in the 1960s with implanted electrodes showing that, in fact, you can change uh, synapses, you can change EEG evoke potentials, the number of uh, discharges of neurons per unit time, I mean, in, you know, cellularly. So uh, there, there's no doubt about the science of neurofeedback. Now, from if you put an electrode uh, on, you know, CZ or two or three or four electrodes, what was found since the 1970s uh, was that um, people would get, uh, they would have to do 80 to 100 sessions. And, um, and then there was some question about whether anybody really got better or not because of the biofeedback. When you go 80 sessions for two years of biofeedback uh, or a year, you're not sure why the person actually is getting better. And so as a consequence in the U.S., the insurance companies refuse to reimburse you know, two, three, four channel EEG. They think it's a hoax. And because you've got 80 sessions with, with one of those things. And then it's, uh, anyway, that, it, now that created a very bad taste uh, in the uh, minds of insurance companies and government agencies about biofeedback. It created a very bad smell. So people don't believe in biofeedback because of uh, one, two channel, four channel things. Okay, that, that's just reality here. We're still fighting that. So to the extent people keep doing, you know, silly things that are not scientific, not actually linked to the brain and not linking the patient's symptoms to the patient's brain, then there's not going to be a, a really good future. There's no reason why an insurance company is going to pay somebody just to play around with one or two channels on somebody's head and not uh, help them. So that, that's really what it comes down to. And so we're still fighting that. Um, in the court of law, for example, in the, today, by the way, that quantitative EEG is admitted throughout the United States. The, the American Academy of Neurology condemned the use of QEG in a court of law. So I had to fight that battle for years, and I've won. And in fact, just yesterday, the Supreme Court of the United States of America admitted quantitative EEG in its, one of its cases. So if you just present, but you can't do that kind of stuff with one or two channels, and nobody, there's, nobody knows what, what's going on there. So it just happens to be the physics of the brain. It's a sphere. The skull is like a sphere. It's modeled mathematically that way. Uh, and the electrical sources are in the interior of the sphere, and then you got electrodes on the sensors on the outside of the sphere, and that's a classic physics. And you got to stick with the science. And now you link it to the parts of the brain related to the patient's symptoms, and at least uh, it makes sense. And you can out actually help people. Dr. Thatcher, do you consider neurofeedback is not really a, an invasive therapeutic or procedure? Please include the professional competence in your answer. Yeah, well, yeah, it is not. Uh, the, the United Healthcare is a big insurance company in the United States. They hired me as a consultant uh, because they don't want to reimburse for biofeedback. So they did a search to try to find that neurofeedback caused harm, okay? 
they did an extensive search. Now, the, the Food and Drug Administration in the U.S. did the same thing. They looked for harm. And they did this for like 10, 20 years. And they failed to find any examples of people getting you know, serious harm. The FDA, Food and Drug Administration, is, they're used to people who are losing arms and eyes and hands or kidneys fail. It's serious things. They did find small anecdotal uh, statements that people, well, they didn't, um, they may have had a headache, they think, they're not sure, uh, but it went away. Here's some of those things, but it's not uh, sufficiently negative. As a consequence, the FDA has an exemption for biofeedback. So if you are a company in the U.S. or wherever and you want FDA clearance or FDA registration, you do not have to submit a 510K application. You're exempted. There's no harm. <laughs> and you have to, but you have to use a battery-powered uh, amplifier. It can't be one you plug into the wall. So if it's battery-powered and you need biofeedback, no harm, you're exempted from uh, you know, the, the more rigorous examination. That's the official position of the Food and Drug Administration. But think about a very incompetent professional. If we can train somebody to function better, we can also train him to function badly. Is not that right? Yeah, that's where it's the responsibility is on your shoulders and mine too when I teach people. We're, we're teachers. So to the extent that we train people to be competent, then they will train other people to be competent. And if there are societies, like in the U.S., there's the AAPB Society and the ISNR Society. Well, they have standards and they have certification. So you want the you know, clinicians to be competent. And most clinicians want to be competent. They just right. need training. Okay? So they, they're genuine. They're, in the, they're dedicating their lives to helping other people. Uh, so and the good thing today is we, we have, uh, because the Internet, go to meeting, Zoom, team viewer. We can do distance training to a fair extent. We can reach larger numbers of people. Uh, the hard part that I found is that people need to be able to record the EEG and, and get good quality EEG. We call it good hygiene, recording hygiene. They need to record from at least 10 patients and know what artifact is and know what uh, EEG is. And once they know what EEG is, and they know the difference, the artifact comes from outside of the brain. Uh, brain egg. So you need to know something that comes from, you know, uh, uh, squinting and moving your head and moving your tongue and your jaw and all those things, and just eliminate that. And once they learn that, then they get good quality data. Then the EEG is 0.98 test be test reliable. I mean, right here, you can see it in NeuroGuide. Test retest reliability on the average is 0.95. Here's 100% of O2, 0.96, 0.97, 0.97, 0.95. Uh, so quantitative EEG is very, very reliable. Yeah, and uh, if, you know, as long as you have good recording hygiene. Okay. According with your experience and your knowledge, Dr. Thatcher, who do you consider is the optimal, you know, the, the qualified professional to perform this technique? I, I mean, QEEG and neurofeedback. Probably the best, some of the best competent professionals. Um, well, most of them are members of ISNR, International Society for Neuroregulation, that I know of. Uh, now, that is a broad spectrum of people. In there, there's people who want to do one channel still. Uh, those are not the ones you want to go to. If you want to do quantitative EEG and be serious about it, you need to find people who are experienced in putting a cap on or a dry electro so they record 19 channels. And then they need to be able to use things like Fourier transforms and uh, the joint time frequency analyses, Hilbert transforms. These are established mathematical methods. So you don't need to know all the math, but they need to want to use them. So there's a whole bunch of people that are just doing one and two channel, four channel. Um, 
they do help to some extent, but they're just not as effective as doing 19 channels. So I would say whoever it is is competent with 19 channels. Um, and uh, I know my team is, we, we, we have workshops all, all the time. Uh, West Center is a really great uh, person. There's, we got what's called NeuroGuide Affiliates. There's a group of people that who are competent in uh, neurofeedback and EEG, quantitative EEG, that uh, train people in different, uh, their own locations. Do you believe just neurophysiology is necessary to be neurophysiology to perform this procedure? Or do you, uh, for example, a neuropsychologist, a psychologist, a well-trained speech pathologist, for example, can perform the procedure in their respective area? Yes, the psychologists are completely capable. They need to know about the brain. I mean, there are people, you know, that uh, are M MDs don't know anything about the brain. So whoever it is, medical doctors, whoever it is, they need to know that the brain has different functions. The amygdala does one thing, the frontal lobe's different than the parietal lobes. There are people who have no idea that uh, inside their skull is this thing floating that's made up of hubs. So the key to it is that, uh, and, and then the recording capability is, they, you know, you have these societies that require these high standards and they give you a certificate, but a lot of these people actually have, they, because neurologists don't care about quantification, they actually don't care about artifact. And I've seen this many times. Uh, myself and E. Roy John, we were at uh, uh, NY, New York, uh, NYU School of Medicine, and uh, in New York Medical College, actually, and we were in discussions with the chairman of neurology, Robert April, who wanted to, us to teach him quantitative EEG, and he was going to teach us, this is in the 1970s, a conventional EEG. And he would do board certification commission. We were developing board certification for quantitative EEG. And so he said, well, to be a good person in EG, you have to have two years of uh, this special courses you got to take. And, and there's only a small number of places you can go. And, and Roy John looked at him and says, hey, Dr. April, let's go outside onto the street, onto Manhattan, right on uh, Madison Avenue. As uh, these uh, young uh, kids are walking by, the high school kids, I'm going to recruit a couple of them. And if they're smart, I'll be able to train them up in one day to be really good technicians. And April said that, Dr. April says, that's impossible, that's impossible. So we stand on Madison Avenue and Roy John signals to these kids. We had like four or five teenagers brought them that wanted to do it, brought them into the brain research laboratories, and we trained them how to do the EEG. And they, they, became, they became employees of the lab up there for a long time. And they're totally competent. So once you can teach them, how to do it and how to recognize artifact and how to recognize real EG. Uh, they, they, those kids are smart. They can easily learn that. They have no problems. And uh, that's really all that's necessary. It was in 2016 in the United States. I, I was interviewing a lot of uh, professionals, teachers, school teachers, kids, parents, etc. And I was surprised to find, I don't know if it's in, in the whole uh, the United States, but at least in Korea, I, I was surprised about the lack of knowledge about this procedure. <laughs> <laughs> In, in most of the uh, professionals. And, and I was surprised too, some parents uh, their kids uh, only with the school teacher report. They say the, the psychiatrist didn't even take an EEG to, uh, to medicate, to prescribe a medication to their kids. Why is this happening? Why, why is no required acute for, for the diagnosis of ADHD or Asperger's syndrome or something like that? Well, it's largely because of that history from the 1930s and 40s and 50s where people visually look at uh, squiggles and they would get in fights with each other and argue and argue and, uh, and, and 
essentially EEG became out of favor. People abandoned it in the 1950s, early 60s. And then they never learned how to use computers. So uh, uh, it's sort of an historical, unfortunate thing. Uh, but uh, it's important to recognize that's the history. Uh, and if anything, politically, you need to get medical schools to uh, include uh, EEG, quantitative EEG, in the curriculum. Because students, that, people that go to medical school don't learn that. They learn about the drugs. Okay, the pharmaceutical industry gives so huge amounts of money to the medical schools <laughs> and to the society. The citizens are paying all these money to the pharmaceutical companies, and so that dominates the curriculum. So they don't get educated. And uh, that's unfortunate, but it's an historical reality. And that's why that is. It's not that they're bad people. It's just that I mean, the psychiatrists and neurologists, they just haven't been educated. And it, it does, does take time to learn how to do it. And one of the beautiful things is like this 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 program it, it, it's it's completely consistent with modern neuroscience it's completely consistent with the national institutes of health uh and all the, the best neural imaging program uh, for example i could look at the fusion tensor imaging here too that's the mri i'm going to turn that on here so you can see there's the fusion tensor imaging of um I'll expand it. And here's here's the, the MRI. This is the actual real MRI. Now it's not this person's MRI. This is a National Institutes of Health um, template MRI. Now it's it's been it turns out the EEG has like one the sources are one centimeter to two centimeter resolution. And uh, the MRI variance be, from person to person is um, uh, not that high, it's pretty small. So if you use, just use a template, that's perfectly fine. You don't have to have the individual's MRI. So given the resolution of the EEG, and that's well established. So you can easily see, here's the problem, the red show, these are Z scores. There's where his parietal lobe is damage is. And then the diffusion tensor imaging, you can look at these different fiber bundles. Uh, go here and I'm going to hide all. Um, we can, uh, I'm trying to expand this. We can look at the, I'm going to look at the groups. I'm going to now, I'm going to look at the cerebellum. That is something two channel EEG at the surface cannot do. Um, this is the vermis. You can get the corpus callosum, anterior commissure, and all that stuff. Um, let me see. I'm going to do the motor cortex also. Anyway, you can get some idea of what you're going to do. Sorry about that. So those are the cerebellar connections. Another way to do the, even better way to do the cerebellum is go to Broadman areas. I'm going to eliminate um, all the, I'll disable all. I'm going to sort by number. Suffice it to say that you can image the cerebellum for people who have Parkinson's disorder, uh, balance problems. In the US, there's over 40 million people older, over the age of 65 who, uh, and many of whom have balance problems. So today, we can help them because we can actually image deep structures. And it's consistent with the PET scans, functional MRI, and uh, all the other sciences that, that you, can, uh, you can determine. Let me go back here and just look at, here's anxiety network. Uh, here's balance problems. Probably the best way to do that is I'm going to go to symptoms. I'm going to go to Parkinson's. And um, 
I don't want to take a lot of your time. I want you to go ahead and ask questions, but um, oh, that, that is the, um, the Parkinson's network. I'm going to get rid of DTI. Amazing. Yeah. yeah, so now you can you can you can compare that to a normative database. You know, that's just the upper part. And I'm gonna go down now to the cerebellum, which is down here. So for Bob Marys. So this is the sensory motor cortex up here, one through four, problem area. And then uh, here's the thalamus. The vermex, the vermis, is all part of the cerebellum. And so this is an important part of what goes on. Here's the subthalamus. Here's the red nucleus. So this network here is important to be healthy for people who have balance problems or Parkinsonism. And that's what you get when you when you use quantitative EEG. You'll never see this if you just look at the squiggles. So, I mean, that's easy. That's the power of quantitative EEG. You cannot get that with conventional EEG. You can't get it with one channel or four channels. You just have to do this and learn how to do it. Once you get a good recording, then it's very easy to learn this. We, we have videos on learning it and webinars on our website and you can look at them at your leisure and uh, and then with this is also available it's a free demo because this is the demo by the way i'm showing you the nerd guy demo it's this uh veteran who was assaulted he was a uh entrepreneur a very intelligent man he had two companies and he was coming home from one of his from work and some people jumped out and hit him over the head with a bat and stole his money so uh, Unfortunately, right. How many do you see they are using uh, this technology in the Spanish speaking world? Uh, you know, I don't know for sure. We have a dis we have distributors. I mean, you're I hope it'll be a distributor or are uh, in um, Mexico. Uh, we have more now coming in Spain. Mm -hmm. um, of course. Brazil is not Spanish, but we got Brazilian distributors. So it's not very many, actually, it's much less. Right now, our greatest growth is in Asia. It's in China, in um, Malaysia, Japan, South Korea. So we're getting, and then of course the US, and there's some growth. We have to compete with Brainmaster in um, Europe. Uh, so we're not doing as well there, but uh, we, we have a superior product to BrainMaster. BrainMaster is uh, not nearly as good as this. They don't have this, for example. We're unique in having this. Okay, um, let's talk about uh, a little bit about the baselines, Dr. Thatcher. Why not using a specific cognitive challenge to assess uh, activation of a specific hubs? Let's talk about the neuropsychological approach. Why just taking a baseline of, you know, one, two minutes of close eyes and two minutes with open eyes? Well, we do that, eyes and open, but I thought you meant a task. <clears throat> no, we, do, we look at eyes open and eyes closed. And they're very, very highly correlated. So we recommend, you know, actually three to five minutes so you make sure there's no artifact eyes closed, three to five minutes, eyes open. But the real question is, what about active tasks? Now, in, at uh, New York Medical College, uh, uh, Roy John and I, uh, Roy John and myself helped develop quantitative EEG. And uh, we both were active task guys, okay? We didn't believe in resting EEG. <laughs> so um, <laughs> we wrote a grant to the National Institutes of Health that had uh, one uh, two sentences on EEG and had 50 pages on active tasks. <laughs> and they funded, they funded us. 
And so we always record eyes open and eyes closed EEG, and then we would do all these active tasks. And after about a year and a half, the National Institutes of Health said, we want to come and visit because we're, we think we may have to cut your budget because we're having budget problems. And so everybody in the in your, in our group at Brain Research Laboratories, we all work like 24 hours a day analyzing data. And the only data we can analyze was the eyes closed and eyes open resting EEG. We didn't have, didn't have enough time to do the active tasks. These were both potential active tasks and EEG, but you know, we, but mostly both potentials. So the and then we found we got 98% discriminatory accuracy between normals versus attention deficit disorder children and learning disabled children. And then we cross-validated it. We got 97% accuracy. And then we cross-validated it again. We got 97% accuracy. And we showed that to the National Institutes of Health uh, visitors, and they were blown away. They loved it. I thought that's fantastic. This is okay, Dr. John. We're going to make sure you continue to be funded. Then we spent three years analyzing the active task stuff, and we can never get above it 0.85. Okay. And we wonder what the heck is going on here? Why is it that resting EEG is more sensitive than active tasks? Well, there's two reasons. One is there's artifact often in the active tasks, so, but we did our very best to get rid of it. And about that time, these studies came out that showed that the amount of energy the brain consumes is higher in a resting state than when you do an active task. You actually, your brain actually consumes less energy when you're writing a check, uh, you know, or when you're doing a task, because it shuts off. And essentially, what's going on is that when you are at rest, your brain is saying, "I'm ready for all possibilities." You never know what's going to happen. A lion may jump out of the street somewhere and jump on me, or some, the roof may collapse. I don't know. This is human nature. So our brain is ready for all possibilities when we're doing nothing. <laughs> as soon as they start doing something, it shuts up a whole bunch of things and says, okay, let's focus on this task. Uh, so if you just measure the resting EEG, and we it took us about 10 years to figure that out, um, or a considerable amount of time, um, you uh, see I'm looking at all the loops in the brain circulating continually. So the brain is continually in motion with a whole bunch of loops, loops, loops within loops, loops between loops, and it's, and it's just out and trying to maximize the amount of resource available at any instant of time because you never know when the lion is going to pounce on you as you're walking through the, through the jungle. So it's right. in our evolution. So all the loops are getting ready for everything. So that's what we measure with resting EEG, and that's why it's much more sensitive than active tasks. And if you do a search of the National Library of Medicine, you'll see the active task sensitivity is much lower than it is for, uh, and much less specific, because you have to use about potentials. I understand. OK. Um... How uh, yeah. how accurate is this? How accurate is the neural guide to provide a neuropsychological reality and cognitive and the emotional challenge? Why? Well, you uh, already tell us uh, it's an accuracy in about 90%. Is that right? Somewhere around there, if you, if you do a search of the National Library of Medicine, type in EEG and neuropsychological tests, or psychometric tests, there's a vast literature there. Very few of them are active tasks, though. In other words, you get a resting EEG, and then you measure the IQ or the attention span or whatever, and then you correlate the two. And it's very common to find, you know, 0 0.8, 0 0.9 uh, correlations. Like if, if the hippocampus is four standard deviations out, you'll find people have memory problems. Right? Uh, if the uh, parietal lobes are four or five, seven deviations out, well, people will have problems with spatial orientation or prosody. If it's right parietal, they uh, have psych psychological problems of recognizing emotion in people's faces, et cetera, just in the resting EEG. Okay. Uh, Dr. Tachi, what makes NeuroGuide uh, so special in comparison with other databases in the market? 
Uh, well, uh, it's probably the best database. It's uh, two things. One, we're the only company, maybe there's others, but I designed this in 2001. Okay? And I decided it would be conventional EEG and quantitative EEG on the same screen at the same time. That's what this is. So we started there because we want, I wanted conventional EEG to always be there because I, I, I'm board certified in conventional EEG. Okay? So, and I teach. I used to teach neurologists conventional EEG. So I want them to be grounded in the waves, but then be helped by looking at the, using modern science and modern mathematics to see what's going on in these waves. What's, what's happening? Because every moment in time, there's a, a pathology, for example, or, or an abnormal functioning will come and go. It, it's there for a short time, and then it's normal, and then it's not, and then it's normal, and then it's not. And what's important is to increase the amount of time where it's normal, where it's actually doing its job, and don't let it get into chaos. So we want to reduce that ratio. So you go reduce periods of chaos and instability and increase the amount of time that the, the neurons are online and doing their jobs. So to have both on the same screen at the same time helps, whether it's epilepsy or a stroke or a tumor, if it's conventional stuff, or it's somebody that uh, has attention problems. So that's one. And the other is, of course, we developed, uh, we have brain optimization index. We got a concussion index with about a thousand subjects with traumatic brain injury. We got cross, we're the only company that does cross frequency coupling is phase amplitude coupling. It turns out this is very important because the limbic system is oscillating in the theta band and the cortex is in the beta band and the high frequencies, but they're talking to each other. So you want to see, well, how well is the limbic system talking to the cortex and the cortex talking to the limbic system? Well, you need cross-frequency coupling. This happens to be the hottest area in neuroscience today, cross-frequency coupling in the EEG field at NIH. Uh, and we're the only company that has it. And so what I do is I read the scientific literature. And I say, wow, look at all this great stuff coming out of NIH on cross-frequency coupling. So let's, let's implement that. So uh, we just start working, writing the code, doing the mathematics, and then here it is. Uh, the Neuro Navigator, well, here's Loretta. This is the Key Institute Loretta. Whoops, I got to try to get this right. My, uh, I don't have a mouse pad here, unfortunately. Yeah, me neither. It's hard. Yeah, I gotta find one. It's, there's one around here somewhere. What I'm gonna do is try it like this. I almost got it. There we go. You got there's, it. Yeah, there's current density, Coherence, phase differences, phase lock, phase shift, phase slope index shows the amount of information flow from point A to point B. So we're the only company that has this stuff. That makes us superior. Cross frequency coherence, brain surfer network. So we have these uh, programs. We also have Neurostat, which is statistics. You can do group statistics, individual statistics, Loretta statistics, compare pre and post treatment, show it to your patients. It says, look at you, uh, you have 50% change in your brain towards normal. You, know? you can do it with Z-scores or raw scores. So we, we have these uh, properties, and here you can change your electrodes. You can, you can also do neurofeedback with just a mouse click. Brain master, you have to do 12 mouse clicks. I went into neurofeedback at the time I had this collaboration with BrainMaster. They wanted us to only do QEG and don't do neurofeedback. And my daughter had gone to the first year in college. She had, she had this course in Chinese. Uh, she's crazy to have taken it. She did okay. She got like a, a B. But she had really hangs up high anxiety when she came back from her first semester. <laughs> And she says, Daddy, can, can, you know, I'm really anxious. I have trouble sleeping. And I said, well, let's do some neurofeedback. And uh, so I got the Brain Master System for a channel. But it took me 12 mouse clicks. And she was, you know, she learned how to do it. And she did her neurofeedback. But it wasn't 
for hugs or anything. I'm not sure it really helped her. But I did say, I said, I can't believe it. I said, Michelle, I think I can do this in two mouse clicks, three maximum. And she says, well, great, Dad. Can you do it tomorrow? <laughs> no, I can't do it tomorrow. <laughs> but it took it till a couple of years. <laughs> well, eventually, that's me introduce it. Another advantage we have, we can like these, all these different amplifiers. Brain Master just has this one crappy amplifier. It's got that discovery crappy thing. We get all of these, and we, we're expanding these all the time. Uh, Cadwell is a new one we're going to be getting in. So we have one of them, but uh, so we have a lot of amplifiers, and we can actually input from 45 different amplifiers. We also have the ability to do evoke potentials. And we have the ability to look at the intercession progress to see how well somebody's brain has moved in the direction of a healthy state over sessions. All of that in one little package, just a few mouth clips. So that's why we're successful, really, is the, the, that. And then we have a high-quality team. We, we have a small company. Um, myself and Ernesto developed this. And this is called SW Loretta. Let's see where this is. Uh, with it, uh, and that is developed by Ernesto Soler, who is an employee of our company. He lives in France, uh, but he's a fantastic person uh, and uh, is very skilled. Uh, he has a now he's Spanish speaking. He's had a bachelor's degree in uh, quantum mechanics. Okay, has a PhD in um, biomedical engineering. Uh, and and uh, you, you know he's uh, he'll, he'll be coming to and right now. Trump is blocking his ability to come to the U.S. <laughs> Even though he has a PhD degree, uh, but eventually uh, we'll try to get him here. He really wants to come and be closer to us. But we communicate every day, uh, and so uh, we, we're developing these tools continually with a small, efficient uh, company. Okay. Um... Dr. Tachi, what kind of outcomes may you expect from a peak performance, from a genius, for example? What kind of population is part of the database? Uh, well, most of our fairly high peak performers in the database, I mean, the database is, is that way. They're, first of all, they're very carefully screened. They have to be performing well in school. Uh, they don't have to have real high IQs, but we took IQs and all the, all the everybody from birth to eight, well, birth you can't do it, but first two months we have the app card scores and you know the healthy babies. And that's the other advantage we have. We have a true lifespan database. It goes from birth, two months of age, out to 82 years of age. The adults, most of them, they are um, peak performing businessmen, and uh, also we had a relationship with West Point. It's a military academy where we have a lot of colonels and majors and uh, high functioning people uh, in the business community. So that's the adult peak performers. Uh, but that, what's important about peak performers is like, for example, we had a, a, a relationship with a baseball team called, it's a professional team in Philadelphia, the Philadelphia Phillies, they call it. And they have, they have pitchers that have trouble concentrating. And so we would measure their EEG, and actually some of them were giving medication uh, under the uh, approval of the uh, baseball league. But we could see there's dysregulation in the frontal lobes of some of these uh, and, uh, and insula in some of the baseball players, and we would give them biofeedback, and they could concentrate a little bit better uh, on the mound. Uh, golf. Uh, People playing golf, they also have attention problems. Mm -hmm. So the ability to just to tweak and improve your ability to concentrate, to attend. Uh, now that we got the cerebellum, you never know. We may be able to improve the functioning of uh, the, uh, you know, swinging a bat or throwing a baseball or shooting a basket. Uh, we don't know, but uh, basically, you can't. You, at least you can see, and it definitely can be used to help people uh, perform better because nobody's perfect. You know? So everybody can be improved in various areas. You need to have a relationship with to the peak performer to see what is it that you want to improve. Yeah. 
it's just a matter of uh, working on the compensation according with the you know the, the performance uh, okay and lastly uh, dr thatcher uh, what do you think what, what, what is the future for the neurofeedback field what do i think of the future of the field or what do i think of the field that gets both huh? <laughs> yeah well I, for both yeah it's um it's unfortunate there's a lot of people scrambling around for crumbs you know so they, they like it's scarce um approval it's scarce and it, it has to be paid for out of pocket that's unfortunate because it means only the wealthy people are being helped and so uh there are people that are very competitive that will say bad things about other people in that group because it's a small competitive group so that's one of the problems uh it, it just we have to accept that and at least i do i just uh stay busy with this and uh, so i see a, a positive future if people can uh, not uh, lose sight of the importance of standards if you have one channel that's not eeg and then you get a thousand people buying it even though it's only ten dollars it just gives a bad smell to the entire field because it's a it's a scam and we don't like things that are, and then innocent people don't know it's a scam because you get really pretty girls telling oh yeah and this, i'll put this on your head yeah but it's gonna be great and well you believe them we believe authorities so well, that creates a stain and so but that's true of a lot of areas of our life it isn't just flat feedback so um i think uh, a program like this helps because it's it's very scientific it's intuitive so if you use good quality tools that are based on solid science this is real stuff uh it's totally tied to the national institutes of health and the scientific uh, literature that can be verified uh, by anybody uh then you lead people in a way that they feel better and they also it enhances their ability to help their patients because they can see that the brain's getting better so i have there's a, if you go to our website we have testimonials okay? We also have nearly, we have 2,000 customers, but probably 3,000 overall, because we sell these Z-score biofeedback, real-time Z-scores to companies like Thought Technology, BrainMaster, MindMedia, Neurofield, et cetera. So we probably have over 3,000, but um, if you if you can go to our website, you'll see the testimonials of pre, how the brain was before neurofeedback, how it was after 10 sessions. And when you begin to show that to your patients, to your clients, and they all they also get better, they feel better, the symptoms go down, they then tell their friends, etc. Then you, know, you will grow a practice. And you do it based on solid science and uh, not a scam, not something that you have to defend and people will say bad things about you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Thatcher. I really enjoy very much uh, this interview and well we, we hope to, to have you once again in the future well okay thank you very much interview all right good talking to you javier you take care